church family and welcome to our online service. I want to read from Psalm 34 verses 1 to 4 this morning. This is a Psalm of David and he says this, 
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Let's seek the Lord together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We pray that You would minister to our hearts today in a mighty way. May You be magnified and glorified, we ask. I pray that You would deliver those that are struggling with fear. We seek You today and we thank You for Your help and Your strength and Your deliverance. Lord, would You minister mightily we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together this morning.
Hello, Sandy, Assembly of God, and Pastor Jeremy. This is Jerry Gibson. And Gwen. <laughs> and it's wonderful to be able to give you this update. We've been asking the same question that you ask. How can you reach college students when nobody can be on campus? Well, we've been asking God for wisdom, and he's been granting that as Chi Alpha's prayer has been, God, help us to be great by being small. We focus as our strategy in Chi Alpha in small group ministry. So really this has been, we've been able to pivot to do online small groups and are finding real success. For Gwen and I and our mission to identify, develop and deploy workers out of the local church for university ministry, this is exactly the strategy that we've been having. I want to share with you our brand new cohort as we launch our second year of training new directors. And that is, we've got six people. This is a picture of our group, uh, online training cohort, six folks in on five different campuses are ministering in Kansas and uh, two in Missouri one in Illinois and one up in New Hampshire. And uh, I, my, my cohort uh, friend, Steve Lehman is also in the red there. He and I are coaching these folks over the next 10 months to reach out to new students on campus. Th these are four brand new plants of the five campuses that are going forward. So please pray for us as we train this new group of leaders. Some other prayer needs that we would ask you to remember is that um, as we continue in this ministry of reaching out to the campuses, one of the key elements is the pastor church connection with these campuses and these new directors we're training. So pray for um, a stirring in the hearts of pastors and other potential workers for next year. As we look to the next year, it's time to start to find those new locations where God would have us um, put in new leadership for new Chi Alpha ministries. Um, also pray for favor with college administration and for continued open doors on campuses. Everything looks different this uh, year going into the fall. So we just need good connections with administration and those in the power of leadership and authority who make decisions um, for our campus ministries going on to the campus and having access. Thank you for your partnership with us to reconcile students to Christ, transforming the university, the marketplace, and the world. God bless you. Bye-bye. He who was before there was light walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing. Behold him. He who heard humanity's cry left his throne
I've titled the sermon this morning, Willing and Able. Last week we talked about how God is able to do all things, that nothing is impossible for Him. And this week we're going to talk about how God cares and how He is willing to meet us where we're at. Last week we looked at Mark chapter 9 about a father whose son was demon-possessed. And the father came to Jesus asking for help for his son. And he said this in Mark 9, 22, But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Amen. And so Jesus is telling us that all things are possible, that nothing is impossible for God. And so we come to Him in faith, believing in the mighty God that we serve. This week, we're going to look at Luke 5 and talk about the leper who, who comes to Jesus. And he's in great need, and he cries out to Jesus for healing. And he actually says this in Luke five twelve to Jesus, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And so last week, we looked at Lord, if you can, and this week we're going to look at, Lord, if you will. And there's a big difference between if you can and if you will. And I think more likely, we probably struggle more with the second one, God, if you will, because we know all things are possible for God, but we wonder, is God going to meet me in my situation? If you can deals with whether or not Jesus has the power to accomplish something. If you will deals with whether or not Jesus is willing to do so. And so my hope is that through last week's sermon and then with this sermon this week, that we are reminded once again that all things are possible for God, that He is a mighty God, and that He cares about your situation, and that you can come to Him because He is willing to meet us as a loving and caring and compassionate Father. So let's look at Luke chapter 5 together, starting at verse 12. And it says this, While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Well, let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you that we as your people can come to you I thank you that you are a mighty God, that all things are possible for you. But I thank you that not only are you a mighty God, but you are a caring, caring Father. That you know what we need before we even ask. You tell us to ask, and that you know what we're facing. And so I pray that you would help us, that you would build our faith through this message today to, to, to realize and recognize what a good and gracious Father you, to, you are to us. Would you speak to our hearts today, I pray, and would you grow our faith and our understanding of how good you are? And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the text to me, this text really demonstrates Jesus' compassion, his care, his concern. The leper realizes that Jesus can heal him. He comes to Jesus asking for help, and he says to him, if you, if you will, He's not so certain that Jesus will, but he knows Jesus can. And, and I think this is where we sometimes find ourselves. We know that Jesus has healed others. We know that Jesus has provided for others. We even know that Jesus has healed us at times in our lives or provided for us. But we're not sure if he's going to help in a certain situation. And so I, I hope to build our understanding and our faith and our confidence in how good and merciful God is to us. Lord, if you will, he says, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Jesus stretched out his hand, notice this, and he touched him. Jesus shows compassion by touching the man, by touching the leper. 
We may not think this is a big deal. We, we read it quickly. But, oh, church, that we would recognize how amazing this is, the compassion that Christ showed towards this leper. Those with skin diseases in biblical times, lepers, they could not go near people. In fact, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, to warn people around them um, that they were coming, that they were a leper, that they had a skin disease. According to Leviticus 13, verse 45, the leprous, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. And the warning was important for other people, right? To, to, to know and be aware and not come in close contact with him. But how horrible it must have been to feel to know you're an outcast, but then to have to announce as you go along for the sake of others that you are unclean, that you are unclean. You know, I have an older sister. She's about, I think, 10 years older than I am. And she was going to Northwest uh, College, now Northwest University. And, and I came to visit one time. I was probably 9 or 10 years old and was going to hang out with my big sister on the college campus. And I remember she, she took me in to show me her dorm. And when we came up to the hallway, she had to shout out when we got, got, got into the hallway, um, guy in the hall. She had to warn everybody, guy in the hall. <laughs> and it was funny to watch as the doors opened and the girls peeked out to see who was there in the hallway. And of course, to their disappointment, it was just a nine-year-old kid with a cowlick uh, on his head. But she said, guy in the hall, she had to warn them, let them know ahead of time. This is what a leper would have had to do. He would have had to shout out before him if, if people were around, unclean, unclean. And I can't imagine how difficult this must have been. Who knows how long it had been since this leper had been touched, had had somebody hug him and hold him. Maybe it had been a year, maybe it had been decades since he had felt somebody wrap their arms around him and care for him. Jesus speaks of his willingness and he heals the man. Jesus says, I will be clean. And the man is healed. These are really great words of compassion. And it also shows us Jesus' heart for those in need. He is not only able to deliver you, he is willing to deliver you. Not only able, but willing, church. I want us to hear from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Our Father in heaven cares about us. And we as earthly fathers are evil in comparison to a perfect and a holy God. But we as earthly fathers, we care for our children and would want to do whatever we could to help them, to care for them, to guide them, to strengthen them, to provide for them. How much more so does our Father in heaven know and care about what we need, church? Oh, that we would see His compassion and His kindness towards us. Psalm 34, verse 18, listen to these words. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Are you brokenhearted? The promise then is that He is near to you and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord is not only near you, but He saves you. He comes to your rescue. What a promise this is. Just as God reached out, just as Jesus reached out and touched the leper, do you realize that 
He reaches out and, and touches us today in healing, in provision, in direction as a follower of His, that He saves us, that He delivers us, that He gives us hope. In fact, Psalm 46 says that He is a very present help in trouble. I like that, don't you? Not just present, He's very present. Are you in need? Then the promise is that He is very present. He is a caring and a gracious God. I heard a minister some years ago one time talk about how we find four different answers to our prayers when we seek God. Right? We've learned in, that the leper came to Jesus. He, he, he sought Jesus for help. We learn in Matthew 7 that Jesus says that we ask, that we seek, that we knock. So we need to come to Him and ask. But there are four different answers we find to our prayers. He said sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says slow. Sometimes God says grow. And sometimes God says go. And I want to look at all four of these briefly this morning. Sometimes as we pray, sometimes God says no to our prayers. We may not like to hear this, but God knows what is best for us. And I am so thankful that sometimes He says no to those things that would actually cause us hurt and, and harm or keep us from the best that He has for us. Um, you know, I as a father, I sometimes say no to my children. I don't do this because I want to prevent them from having fun or because I don't care about them. In fact, I do this because I want them to enjoy life. I want them to live a healthy and a happy life. I want them to grow. Um, so sometimes I say no, maybe to, you can't eat that whole thing of ice cream. No to something like that, and it's out of care or compassion. You know, it's been said that Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, that she had said that God had not always answered all of her prayers, because if he had, she said she would have married the wrong man twice. Well, I guess in, her, in this case, he did answer her prayers by saying no. You see, God knows what is best for us. And so sometimes the answer to our prayer, which is an answer, is a, is a no, my child. This, will, this is not what is best for you. This is not what is greatest for you. We see with the Apostle Paul who, who, fle, uh, who pled uh, three times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed from him. We don't know exactly what the thorn in the flesh was, but three times Paul prayed. And many believe that it wasn't just three prayers that he prayed, but three seasons of prayer as Paul sought the Lord's deliverance from whatever this was that he was facing, this situation. And Jesus said no to him, but then notice this, but Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Isn't that good? Why Jesus didn't remove the obstacle, whatever it may have been, He gave Paul the strength and the grace to navigate it well, to be strengthened in it and through it by God's hand. So sometimes God says no, and we're thankful that He knows what is best for us. Sometimes God says slow to our prayers, right? We sometimes get ahead of uh, I think how the Lord desires to move in our lives and, and what He's doing. And so sometimes God says slow. David waited for God to raise him up to be king of Israel. He had already been anointed by the prophet Samuel, and yet it took a long time for him to finally become king. Saul, who was king before David, came after David to try to kill him on a few occasions. And David had a chance to kill Saul. And we would have said he is certainly justified at the, in those moments for if he would have killed Saul because Saul was after David. And yet David did not do that, did he? David realized that he would not touch the Lord's anointed and that God's timing was best and God raised him up. Oh, that we would realize and recognize uh, that God knows what is best. And sometimes God says slow. He's preparing us. He's preparing the situation. He's, he's working. And in fact, this leads us to our, our, our next point, which is this, 
Sometimes God says grow to our prayers. You see, maybe the situation is, is ready, but we're not ready. Maybe God is still working in us and preparing us for what He has. God is working in our lives. Maybe it's the young person who wants to be married so badly and they're, they're praying, God, God, bring that right person, please, please. And, and God begins to whisper into their heart, my child, I first want you to become that right person. There's still some areas of your life that I want to, to work on and move, move in before I bring that right person across your path. Maybe for some it's a desire to go into vocational ministry and it seems like the doors aren't opening and you're trying to kind of force them open. And maybe God is saying, child, I've got some more growth for you. Grow first. Yes, I have this for you, but, but don't get ahead of me. The Bible speaks of, of, for example, not letting a new convert become a minister lest they become conceited. And so there's this need to grow. Um, and so sometimes God is working in our lives and, and the answer to our prayers is eventually yes, but right now, grow. I'm doing something in you as you wait. And then fourth, sometimes God says go to our prayers. And by this we mean green light, that God is answering our prayers. And how often God is met me in an immediate way, and I've prayed about something, and an hour later, two hours later, uh, the answer comes. Um, last week, I had a, a, a bad migraine and, um, on Sunday, and Dan and Camille, uh, they had texted Elizabeth, and Elizabeth had told them that I had a migraine, and they prayed for me immediately. They just, they, they, they just, they, they prayed, um, and well, you're trying to figure out the time frame because I believe right when they prayed, that is when I felt the migraine just lift. It was, I, I literally was sitting outside with a migraine just hurting, and all of a sudden it lifted. Uh, I believe it was an immediate answer to their prayers. As we close, what can we do as we await on God's answers to our prayers? Yes, certainly sometimes God meets us immediately, like He met the leper in the situation, and the leper comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, I will be clean, and the leprosy left him. But sometimes we go through things, and we're in them for a while. So what do we do as we await God's help and God's answers? Well, we can dig trenches. We can dig trenches. And you say, what do you mean, dig trenches? Well, Charles Spurgeon, um, in a in his devotion, Morning and Evening, which I highly uh, recommend to you, uh, had a, uh, one of his devotions in May, in fact, it was May 16th in the evening, where he talked about this concept of preparing for what God wants to do in our lives. And so I really want you to hear this, because this might be part of the growth that before God answers the prayer, what He's doing in us before He, he brings about that answer that we've been seeking. So 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this, And he said, Thus says the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink both you and your cattle and your beast. And so you remember this, the armies, it looks like they're going to die of thirst. And God tells them to dig trenches and that He was going to provide supernaturally for them. And Spurgeon writes this, he says, The armies of the three kings were famishing for want of water. God was, was about to send it, and in these words the prophet announced the coming blessing. There was a case of human helplessness. Not a drop of water could all the valiant men procure from the skies or find in the wells of earth. Thus often the people of the Lord are at their wit's end. They see the vanity of the creature and learn experimentally where their help is to be found. Still, the people were to make a believing preparation for the divine blessing. They were to dig the trenches in which the precious liquid would be held. The church must, be, must, by her varied agencies, efforts, and prayers, make herself ready to be blessed. 
She must make the pools and the Lord will fill them. This must be done in faith in the full assurance that the blessing is about to descend. Spurgeon writes, By and by there was a singular bestowal of the needed boon. Boon. Not as in Elijah's case did the shower pour from the clouds, but in a silent and mysterious manner the pools were filled. The Lord was Lord has his own sovereign modes of action. He is not tied to a manner and time as we are, but does as he pleases among the sons of man. It is ours, thankfully, to receive from him and not to dictate to him. We must also notice the remarkable abundance of the supply. There was enough for the need of all. And so it is with the gospel blessing. All the wants of the congregation and the entire church shall be met by the divine power in answer to prayer. And above all this, victory shall be speedily given to the armies of the Lord. What am I doing for Jesus? Spurgeon writes. What trenches am I digging? O Lord, make me ready to receive the blessings which thou art so willing to bestow. And so maybe as we close, God is reminding you that He wants you to prepare for the blessing. He wants you to prepare for the promise to be fulfilled. I don't know what that looks like in every situation, but I do know that we spend time in prayer and we spend time in His Word and we, in faith, trust Him to be obedient to prepare what He asks us to prepare as we receive the blessings that He desires to bestow upon us. So let's seek Him today. And if you're in need of prayer, I would just ask in your living room, uh, you're in need of God's healing maybe, God's provision, God's freedom. Would you just lift your hands right there where you're at? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And I ask that you would come right into our homes, even right now, in a miracle-working way, that you would divinely heal people that are suffering. Jesus, you said to the leper, I will be healed, be cleansed. And he was healed at that moment. And I ask that you would heal your people. I ask that you would restore. I ask that you would provide in the name of Jesus. Father, for some, you're asking us to prepare for your blessing that is to come. And so as they begin to dig the trenches, Lord, as they, as they are obedient to what you show them, maybe for some it's fasting and prayer. I pray that you would help them to know what that means to dig those trenches in their lives, to be prepared for the blessing that you so desire to bestow upon their families, upon their own lives, upon even our city, our church, our state, our nation. Lord, we need you. And so we ask that you'd pour out your spirit upon this land. Forgive us, Lord. Come in a powerful way. We ask us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe for some of you, you uh, are not following Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John the Baptist, looking at Christ, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist saw in Jesus that he was the sacrificial lamb, that he was the one that was promised to come pay for our sin, that by faith in him, we can be washed clean, we can have everlasting life. And so have you surrendered your heart to him? You, you know you've fallen short, you know you failed. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of our sin, the Bible says, is death. This is what we deserve. Eternal separation from God, the second death, which goes on and on forever, eternally, apart from Christ, is what the wages of our sin deserves. But God in His mercy and His graciousness and His love sent His Son that by faith in Christ and what Christ has done for you, you can have everlasting life. And so if you know you're not following Christ and you want to today, I just would ask that you would pray this out loud with me. It's not so much the exact words that we're praying, but it's 
the idea that you're recognizing that you need a Savior, that you're, that you're full of sin, but Christ is the Savior that has come to cleanse us of sin and make us new. So would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I am sorry for my sin. I know I have failed you so much. So I ask that you would wash me. I ask that you would forgive me. I ask that you would make me new. Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again on the third day. I believe that you're coming soon. Make me one of your children. Thank you for salvation in you. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, would you uh, send me an email? Send an email to the church letting me know that you've responded to Christ.